भगवते वासुदेवय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवय वेलकम एवरीबॉडी वी आर ऑन द फिफ्टींथ चैप्टर द गीता start a new section. Oh, let's just dive right in. It's a um the 15th chapter it, it does pretty well without uh, a connection to the 14th chapter. It's pretty easy to get from the uh to get in the 15th chapter without having any kind of an intro. you'll see. We'll maybe we'll try to connect the dots in a second. Um It is said that there is an imperishable banyan tree which has its roots upward and its branches down and whose leaves are the Vedic hymns. whose leaves are the vedic hymns one who knows this tree is the knower of the vedas so let's let's do it one more time it's said that there is an imperishable banyan tree that has its roots upwards visualize it the roots are going upwards and its branches are down and the leaves of the vedas one who knows this tree is the knower of the vedas so banyan trees or ashwatha trees this says ashwatha the different tree it's super similar to the banyan tree it's from the same family Uh, I think it's called it's a ficus which I think it's like a fig type tree. I think it's called ficus religiosa but I like didn't bother. I think there's actually like a religious ficus thing that's going on. I can't remember what the exact name is though in Latin. But um the the banyan tree and the ashwatha tree are both Ashwatha literally means you put your horse there. Ashwa means horse. So ashwatha means you keep your horse there. like you wrap your horse at, like with a rope around the tree and then you keep your horse there so the banyan tree and the ashwatha tree are atypical there are probably other trees like them but they're pretty unique if you see them you remember it they 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 have secondary trunks that shoot down from their branches. So when you get an old tree, you'll see the main trunk and it'll have a huge canopy that couldn't possibly be uh supported by the tree. You know, you can only support so large of a canopy because it as you put I don't know how exactly it works, but when you have the fulcrum and the moment arm I'm not exactly sure how it works but the further you get out I mean I know the principle the further you get out away from your center then the more you feel the weight and the less strength you have which is why it's easier to push someone's arm down out here than it is to push their arm down from here because they're close to the center of gravity and there's less uh uh leverage so they have these massive canopies that come off of them which would just break they're just they're so wide so what the tree does it shoots down secondary roots and those secondary roots actually turn into what looks like trunks i mean really what is a trunk but a huge root right and so they shoot down these secondary roots and then those roots so provide 
additional support for the canopy. And sometimes you can even walk in between those trunks. It's almost like you're walking through a forest, but it's actually one tree. You guys follow this? So that's, uh, that's obviously what's being described here. But there's a little bit of a, a twist. And the twist is... It's upside down. Yeah, it's upside down. Actually, we're not there yet. I'm sorry, I kind of like got ahead of myself. Let's read the second verse. Otherwise, what I said doesn't really make sense. The branches of this tree extend downward and upward, nourished by the gunas. The twigs are the object of the senses. The tree also has its roots going down, and these are bound to the fruit of actions of human society. So, um, branches going down definitely communicates you know, perhaps this banyan tree model, the Ashwata tree model. And then the roots also going down with the branches going down really communicates the point. Did you guys get that? When you say the branches are upwards, excuse me, the branches are upwards, roots are downwards, is a regular tree. The roots are upwards and the branches are downwards, is a, an upside-down tree, perhaps a reflection of a tree in the water. Also communicates the idea that the ground of being is located in heaven, and so things in this world are connected through a great chain of being, right? To something, a scala natare, a great chain of being above it. You follow? There's that idea too that everything comes from God, and there's a natural order, a sacred order, a scala naturi, a, a sacred order of, of, of existence, a natural order of things, where everything comes from divinity. You, that was it. You showed me a little too much leg. It's okay, you're good now. So, this sacred order um, where everything comes from divinity, everything is connected to divinity. You following? Pay attention, Shay. Here, don't look at the book. Eyes up front, good. Um, so one thing you get with the idea of the roots facing upwards is you get the idea that the tree is coming from God. Or it's coming from heaven. Or it's coming from spirit. Then with the tree being upside down, it makes you think of a reflection. That this material world is perhaps a reflection of the spiritual world. That definition doesn't exactly require the banyan or the ashwata tree the way we know it. Because you could just say this is some sort of a mystical tree, a tree of life. It's some kind of metaphor. And it's just meant to communicate that everything grows from God. In which case the branches growing downwards and the roots growing upwards, you don't have to problem solve that in the material world because the whole thing could just be a metaphor. Do you guys follow that? But given that it's an Ashwata tree, and the Ashwata tree do have these secondary trunks that are there to support the canopy, at least the first verse is suggestive when you start saying stuff is growing downwards, the branches are growing downwards, because that's actually what happens. Those secondary trunks are really, they're, they're branches that shoot off and roots that shoot off from the branches. So in that sense, the branches are growing downwards to form a secondary trunk, a secondary root. Did you guys follow this? 
So you could either see the entire thing as a metaphor, which does work to communicate the point that everything comes from God. You could also see the whole thing as a metaphor that this world is a reflection of the spiritual world. Which also has a lot of value. If you want to understand something about God and you don't just want to follow a text and you want to legitimately in a non-arbitrary way where I can say I follow my text and you say you follow your text. Now, let's say we are comparing texts. I say I follow my book and you say you follow your book. Well, if my book contains a bunch of compelling arguments and logic and reason and your book contains a bunch of ridiculous, you know, rules just for the sake of rules without any rhyme or reason behind them, then I can still say even if you got to follow a book, I'm following a better book than you. Does that make sense? So within comparative religion, you can still just take a look at what's in the text itself and see what is better or worse, and you can put together an argument. It's not just because you're both following a sacred text that, you know, all logic and all reason go out the window. But if you aren't just saying, I'm following a book, and then, like I said, there are reasons you can give for why you follow that book, but if you're looking for a natural faith, if you're looking to figure out something about the nature of your maker, something about where everything comes from, and you're in this world, then the only thing you can do to understand something about your maker is to look at yourself and notice things like consciousness and also order and understand that, you know, that the deity is probably both conscious and ordered. An ordered universe is the child of God, therefore God would tend to be logical and ordered. And we are conscious, therefore our maker must possess consciousness because we can't derive consciousness from any simpler substance or interaction. And so these are ways that without looking at a sacred text, without blindly following something, so to speak, but again, it's not quite blind following. It's not quite blind following. It's not, it's not quite that. Uh, there, there is something to be said for reading a text and giving it a fair shake and testing out its hypotheses if they pass muster, so to speak, and, 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 and you know, get you off the ground. But if you do want to just start from nothing, then you look at yourself and you understand something about your maker. Seeing this world as a reflection of that world has value. It's, it's intuitive. It's automatic. It's the way we function when we're trying to trace out the origin of something. We look at the effect and then we try to reason back to the cause. I see everybody's dying. It must be that all men are mortal. I see that things tend to disintegrate. There must be a principle called entry, uh, entropy. I see that things tend to fall. There must be a principle called gravity. I see the tide goes up when the moon comes up. There must be something related with the moon and its, its, its force it's being exerted on the earth. You look at the world, you start to understand something about how it's made by looking at it. And you start to search out through the effects and you reason back to the cause. That's why the term cause and effect is, that it is poor from a philosophical point of view. Because the actual way it works is you go effect to cause. You look at the effect, then you work your way back to the cause. Even when you talk about deductive logic as being super strong and you can make really good proofs deductively and your proofs are much less strong if they're made inductively or inferentially. And so, but the backbone of all deductive logic, all big logic, is simple observation. How do I know that all men are mortal? Because I see a bunch of people dying around me and then I'm able to reason back to the big point that all men are mortals, I can start to work with those bigger concepts. So, even from an intuitive point of view, the idea, the, the meditation of looking at the world as a reflection of divinity has a lot of value. Of course, if you look at the world as being a perfect representation of divinity, then what's the problem? 
then divinity is not so divine after all. Because this world is filled with temporality and imperfection and error and negative qualities. And so looking at the world as a reflection has value in that it allows you to see something of the form of this world and see that that must be represented in transcendence, but not to be married to exactly matching up every detail. For instance, is there rape in heaven? Trigger warning. I'm supposed to say that beforehand, but sorry. Uh, is there rape in heaven? No. But if you take rape and then you think, okay, well, what is rape? Rape is sex. At least it's, a, it's on some level it is. It's a perverted form of sex. It's a, I don't know, destructive form of sex. It's an intercourse without the intimacy. And so at least it has something in common with sex. You know, from a, a far distance, rape might look like sex. If it was like, you know, far enough away and you couldn't hear the person screaming or see them flailing, just the act of two bodies coming together might look like it was consensual. And so at least there's some similarity in form, if not substance, between rape and sex. You follow this? And so then, like, what is sex? It's intimacy. It's people coming together. So if you start to essentialize and sort through the discrepancies you find in how things manifest in this world in a perverted way, then you can look at heaven as being a sort of purified seed-like form of everything which ends up growing in a bunch of funky directions in this world. Did you follow that? And so sex becomes this perverted, detrimental, deleterious, degrading form of intimacy that is actually the opposite of intimacy. And so that wouldn't be in heaven, but the pure form of everything would be. This actually has a little bit in common with Plato's whole realm of forms, which I don't want to get into in too much detail because it's kind of a funky idea that takes take 10 minutes to describe, and I don't think it has a lot of value to what we've already said, but anyway, Plato, perhaps Socrates before him, had this idea that because he noticed as he looked around that, you know, all birds shared certain basic features in common, like wings and the ability to fly, and instinct and laying eggs, it seemed like there was something that tied them all together. So instead of pausing that they had, you know, genetics, then they posited there was this realm of forms and there was some sort of a heavenly abode or some sort of a philosophical place in the universe where everything which has wings and is a bird and can fly is participating in that essence of a bird. And that's why you see that, you know, there are species and there are common features of everything that exists. Anyway, it gets in this whole thing of then as you fulfill the purpose you were created for, like you were created for thinking because you have a big brain and you know, birds are created for flying. As we do our dharma or the thing we're created to do, we then connect with our creator and that realm of forms, which is where we derive our purpose. And when we go against our purpose, like uh, King Lear, he says, if I, you know, if I love my citizens not, then chaos has come. And so, like in Shakespeare, and so the idea that king must love his citizens. And so when a king loves his citizen, he's participating in the natural order of kings, and he's actually connecting with God who created the whole show. And so Plato stopped a little short of believing in God, per se, but he did get high enough up to believe in this sort of heavenly realm where the philosophical essence of all things existed, which allowed you to not arbitrarily create your dharma, but participate in something greater than yourself. How did I do there? That was pretty quick, right? Yeah. What's the wrong forms called again? In Greek. Yeah. Okay. I thought somebody was going to bust it out for me in Greek. But anyway, it, it shows up. It shows up in, in Plato's works. I think it shows up in Timaeus, one of his works. And he gets into it and kind of describes this. And you really, you see, it's, it's really like primitive science is really what it is. 
And it's really the same idea of looking at the world and looking at what's common in the world and then trying to figure out where things, um, where things come from. Looking for commonality in the world and then trying to postulate where those things ultimately come from. And so maybe rape doesn't exist in heaven, but I think you could certainly make a better argument that sex does. And if that's a little too racy for you, a little too risque for you, you could at least argue that intimacy exists in heaven, which then becomes the essence of sex. You follow? Rape is this sort of like perverted form of sex. Sex could even be seen as an overly externalized form of intimacy, and therefore at least intimacy exists, intimacy exists within heaven. But in this way, you're looking at the world, and by seeing it as a reflection, instead of as an actual replica, which even still, if it's a replica, it's not the real thing. Replicas are still not the real thing. But anyway, instead of seeing it as an exact manifestation, by seeing it as a reflection, we're able to essentialize things in this world and be a little more philosophical and troubleshoot some of the flaws that are naturally existing within the world. You can lay down, do whatever you want, like totally do your thing. Just don't flash me and we're good. But other than that, you can like lay on your side, you got a bunch of cushions there, like do whatever you need to do. Super honored that you're here. Um, does that make sense? So just this idea that there's a, a, a um, this idea that there's a, a a reflection, and you know, like the reflection of the sun in the water. Does the reflection of the sun in the water give heat? Probably not. Does it does it ripple and move with the waves? Does that mean the sun's rippling and moving? It does not. Does it at least point out that there's something out there called the sun? Yes, it does. And in that sense, there is some truth to it. And if you become expert, you can see the value in the reflection and help that guide you and act as a legend in your navigating of a map, in your navigating towards some kind of deeper truth. Did you follow that? at least we get that from the first verse. The second verse messes it up a little bit, but it's suggestive because the Ashwata tree, it says the branches go downwards. And so if you did want to go into what I just, like when I went on a whole big thing with a ficus religiosa, and, and, uh, which I'm almost certain is the name of it, which is pretty cool, right? Ficus, I believe, means fig. And then religiosa is this. Not all figs produce actual figs, by the way. But then... Uh, uh, it's a religious ficus because either the Ashwata tree and the Banyan tree are super sacred in India. Super sacred in India. When you do a yagna, you get wood from those trees and it's really good to use in a yagna. Tulsi is also really good to use in a yagna. There's different trees, you know, the pipal tree. Like we go through pipal koti, you know, that Indra Lok place where you guys eat. That South Indian, North Indian. Yeah vegetarian restaurant where you guys eat called Indra Lok where Howard wanted to stay and so we had to like give him some Benadryl and like handcuff him to the back so we got up to Badrinath. Were you there for that? Yeah. So that place Pipal Koti means millions of Pipal trees and the Pipal tree is this like super straight tree with like little like thorns growing off of it and then it, it makes a really cool staff so sannyasis and renunciates traditionally used it. Or the Arjun tree. Arjun. Arjun means straight. So the Arjun tree is straight, straight up and down. So these trees, they all have like their specific purpose. They're like kind of, some of them are religious. They're used in religious ceremonies and rituals. And so this tree, you know, the Ashwata tree is mentioned in the Veda. It's mentioned in the Upanishads. It's an old tree. Krishna's connecting us to an older Vedic tradition. He's using metaphors. And, and religious symbolism, which has been used for a long time, even at the time the Gita was composed, it was religious symbolism, which was well in use and been used for a long time. And so, just like the Jewish revelation, excuse me, the Christian revelation of Jesus on the cross is really a, a nouveau rendition 
on the Jewish sacrificing of a lamb during the Passover. And now Jesus is the sacrificial lamb. And now there's a human sacrifice being done. And the same principle of sacrificing the animal to please the deity is there. But now Jesus is the Son of God. Really, it's God sacrificing himself for the sins of man, which becomes so um, excessive that there was you know, no way to fix things. So when you look at the Christian revelation, it's really a, like a, an attempt at a 2.0 version of the older Jewish revelation. And so in many ways, you can see the Gita as being some footnotes or some further revelation on a pre-existing tradition. And now it's, it's nourished by the gunas. We learn that. It's nourished by the gunas. And the branches are also, the roots are also growing downwards. So now once you say the roots are also going downwards, the mere reflection thing doesn't work anymore. It gets a little more eerie and a little more funky. And so you can't just, the tree isn't just some divine thing coming down from heaven because the roots are also growing downwards and they're nourished by the gunas. And the gunas are pretty much the Sanskrit equivalent of what word? Yeah, the gunas are, huh? It, it literally means ropes or strands and it, we do translate as modes. What Western concept do the gunas occupy in Sanskrit and Indic philosophical thought? Materialism. Materialism, sure. Materialism refers to, you know, like, uh, I want diamonds and, and fine things. Do the gunas represent that necessarily? They do not. Fruit of action. Okay. Fruit of action. Sattva doesn't represent that so much. Tamas doesn't represent that so much. People in Tamas are just sleeping. People in Sattva are not engaged in that. It's more rajas. What do the gunas really represent? Just if there was a single word in the English language in in, in Western thought, in Western religious thought, that the gunas were a one word translation for. Yeah? The devil? Yeah, evil. There is no concept of evil, because it's a non dualistic tradition. But ignorance really takes the place of evil, and the gunas are the primary manifestation of ignorance in your life. All the gunas are ignorant. Not all the gunas are active and fruitive, all the gunas are ignorance ultimately, in some kind of fundamental way. Tamas is the most straightforwardly ignorance, but sattva and rajas are also ignorant. And so the gunas really are a stand-in for evil in a tradition that doesn't believe in dualism, doesn't believe in the devil, and doesn't believe in fundamental malevolence. And so the furthest you get is basic ignorance that can still be wa washed away can still be cleaned up. You can still be rejuvenated from that. You are fundamentally good. But when you start saying the tree is nourished by the gunas, that whole idea of it coming from heaven, and it's like this, that whole thing, it falls by the wayside because the gunas are decidedly bad. Do you guys follow this? The gunas are the sprouts, so it's bad. The branches of this tree extend downwards and upwards, nourished by the gunas. Oh, I'm sorry. The gunas are nourishing the tree. And then vishaya is pravala. Vishaya is, is the, uh, are the sprouts. Pravala. So the sense objects are the sprouts, also bad. Sense objects are probably as close as you get to the devil, too are the things that entangle you in this world and mess you up and throw you off kilter. 
the twigs are the objects of the senses. This tree has its roots going down, and these are bound to the fruit of actions in human society. So now the idea of the tree just extending upwards doesn't work anymore. The idea of it literally referring to a banana or an ashwata tree as a metaphor, where you look at the tree and then you find what each thing of the tree represents, works now. So there's twigs, that's sense objects. The gunas are nourishing the tree, keeping it alive. It has roots going upwards and downwards, and branches going upwards and downwards, too. It's a mess. It's a mess, a melange. It's like just a big smorgasbord. And being able to just get one thing out of this metaphor is gone now. Did you follow that? It's too complicated. You can't trace it out. When we started, it seemed like we were going to be able to pick through it and figure it out. But by the second verse and third verse, it becomes clear that it's impossible. The real form of the tree cannot be uh, perceived in this world. No one can understand where it ends, where it begins, or where its foundation is, but with determination. One must cut down the strongly rooted tree with the weapon of detachment. So, na rupam, asya iha, tata upalabhyate. You can't ascertain the form of the tree. So, the, we thought we could ascertain the form of the tree, but you can't. Why can't you ascertain the form? Well, Ada cha urdvam prashrishta tasya shaka. The branches go upwards and downwards, they're all spread out. So the branches are going upwards and downwards. Guna pravridha. It's being nourished by the gunas, that's bad. Urdvamula. The branches are, the, the trunk is going up, right? And then uh, shaka, shaka, uh, ada. The branches are going down and the trunk is going up. But now the branches are going both up and down. Nourished by the gunas. Ada chamulani. The roots are also going down. So the roots are going up, roots are going down, branches are going down, branches are going up. Nourished by the gunas. Vishaya pravala. And the, uh, uh, the sense objects are the twigs. Karmanu bandani manushaloke. Um, Mulani uh, Anush Shantatani. The, the roots are spread out going downwards, and the uh, tree is, is following karma and bound to karma in this world of men. So the tree is now fully material, kind of close to evil. And then we also have the Udva Murla, it's going up. And Ashwatam Prahur Avyam, it's said to be an inexhaustible banyan tree. And Chandangsi, Yasya Paranani, the hymns of the Vedas are its leaves. That sounds pretty spiritual. Yastam Veda Saveda Veda. If you know this tree, you know the Veda. So it starts off sounding kind of good, but then by the second verse, it's bad. By the second verse, it's bad. Now the Vedas also have material stuff going on in them. So just saying that its hymns are, the Vedic hymns are the leaves isn't good because Krishna is pretty critical of the Vedas in various places. If you know the tree, you know the Veda, sure. Maybe if you know what to do with the tree, maybe if you know you can't find the real form of the tree, Maybe if you know the tree isn't something to get messed up with. Now, what is there in the English language as a concept, as a symbol? What exists within the realm of experience of human beings or of animals also, but it exists within nature? Something that you think you might be able to extricate yourself or deal with it, but when you actually get into it, 
it enmeshes you and entraps you and ensnares you. What thing in nature has that feature? Quicksand. All right, quicksand. Cool. I didn't think of that one. Spider's web. Who said that? Yeah, I mean, these guys are weird. They play way too many video games. A bunch of dorks. I mean, who the hell, who the hell's ever been in quick, I mean, I've been in quick, I've been in quicksand. But who, other than me, who's ever been in quicksand? Don't lie to me. None of you have been in quicksand. How do you guys come up with that, you know? Huh? I was in some like muddy soil that was like quicksand. My foot got stuck in. Okay, that's just called mud, bro. <laughs> yeah, how far did your foot get caught? Up above the knee. That's like, that's starting to become problematic. Yeah. I got stuck up to my waist. I was losing my mind, freaking out. Um, but yeah, quicksand, whatever. A spider's web, I think, is way more likely. Venus fly, flytrap is a good one, too. You guys are killing me here with all your like creative stuff you come up with. Like, what is this? Like, you guys watch way too much National Geographic or Discovery <laughs> Channel. Like, it's a spider's web. Come on, man. It's like it's easy, right? You just get in it, and as you try to get out, you get in even worse. Of course, that's also true with quicksand. Not really true with the Venus flytrap. That's just a whole other ball game. I don't even know what a Venus flytrap does. I mean, I know, like, I guess it digests you with its digestive juices after it traps you with jaws of death. Um, but yeah, you get this spider's web. I, I really feel like when you start to think about this, branches are going up, branches are going down, roots are going up, roots are going down. It's bound to this world. It's nourished by the gunas. There's an evil element to it. It's seductive. It's deceptive. The, the leaves of the Vedas. And so if you know how dangerous a spider's web is, what do you do? You avoid it. There is no navigating it. You just have to avoid it. I mean, at least if you're an animal, like if you're a small insect. Obviously, for human beings, we can just wipe our hand and ruin their life. But their life's work, we can ruin in five seconds. But um, if you're a small enough living entity, the spider's web is just something you have to learn to avoid. You're not going to master it. Spiders can master the spider web somehow. I don't know how they swing it. I guess they're just like the way their limbs are. They're just delicate enough where they can just float on top of it. It's totally wild. One side sticky, the other side isn't. They know which side to put their feet on. Okay. <laughs> All right, now we're talking. That's what I'm looking for from you. That's quicksand mumbo jumbo and Venus flytraps. Some good, good, good old stuff on the unsticky side of spider's web. I didn't know that. I do sometimes know that when I hit a spider's web with my hand, I just get rid of it. Other times I hit it and it's like stuck to my hand and I'm miserable. That's probably because I'm hitting the right side or the wrong side. So as I go around ruining the lives of spiders <laughs> in my free time. Um, yeah. So, you know, when I think about the metaphor which was used, I like the analogy of a spider's web also. And so when you know na rupam asya iha upalabhyate, you can't perceive the real form. Na anta, na cha adi, na cha sampratishta. You don't know the foundation of it. You don't know the beginning of it. You don't know the end of it. It's interesting because the basic principle that everything comes from spirit, you can understand that. But if you try to really intricately figure out the material world, 
you just get stuck in it. It never ends. Like, for instance, if you try to extricate yourself from all karma. Like the Jains, you know, they only eat, they don't eat root vegetables. And then they walk around with a broom sweeping the ground in front of them to sweep insects out of the way. And then they wear a mask. Right? But with all the microbes in the water. If you're going that route, that's the game of karma. What about all the microbes in the water and all those an little animals you're killing? Like the microscope ruined their whole philosophy. <laughs> also, what happens when you jack an animal, like a little teeny weeny animal with your, uh, with your broom? How about that? Right? Uh, during the 70s, the Jains, you know, they're, they're famous for being super pious and ahimsa. And so they were selling ghee in India, but they were mixing it with, with either lard or pig fat. I can't remember. And it got discovered because the Jain businessmen were such paisa wallas, such, I don't know what the right word is, shekel misers, whatever the word is. Shysters, thank you. There were such shysters and paisa wallas that they were, they were selling contaminated ghee. Probably heard about this. Like, that's why we need farms. That's why we need our own cows. Not that's why we need to, you know, be vegan and just not deal with the cows. That's why we need to take care of the cows ourselves and only take dairy products we get from our own cows. Um, so, yeah, you can understand the basics of it that things are a spiritual source, but the idea of unpicking the material world. Like if you want to, get, if you want to stop smoking weed. A friend of mine went from smoking a half ounce of weed every day, which I can't even wrap my head around. That's 14 grams of weed a day. Like I don't even know how you do that. It's like a lot of money, A, and then B, it's just like, it seems like way too much weed. Like even though, like, I mean, you must be like, somebody smoking that much weed must be like rolling huge, huge spleefs and just like hanging out all day and just like throwing it away, which I was, I was always so poor when I was using drugs. I would never, I was never so extravagant and flamboyant. I was too much of an actual drug addict who valued the commodity. And it wasn't just like for show or something like that. Um, but anyway. He went from smoking a half an ounce to smoking half a gram every day. So that's, you know, he's cut down his usage by 28 times. You know, he's roughly down to below 5%, 4%, 3.5% is really what he's doing right now of what he used to do. That's pretty amazing. And you know what you have to do at some point? You just have to stop. And this idea of, like, I'm just going to whittle it down a little bit. At some point, you just have to stop. And then you suffer because it was a crutch. And you got to go through that pain and that withdrawal because there was so much of a psychological addiction and there was so much of a habit that formed around it. And it represents so much more than just the intoxicating effects, but it was some kind of a, a crutch and something familiar in difficult times that you used above and beyond the actual medicinal intoxicating effects and you have to contend with that and it's like scary and changing your life and change and something new and giving something up that's like an old blanket, a security blanket that you've worn for so long, an old coat that you've worn for so long and it fits just right and you don't want to give it up for a new world. But you just, at some point you just have to actually just cut the knot and give it up. And it, you, you never just glide out. It doesn't work like that. It's always a little unpleasant and a little painful on the back end because you did it wrong. You don't want that pain on the back end, then you gotta do it right on the front end. It's just the way it works. No pain on the back end it means you do it right on the front end. You step up and do it right today on the front end, and then you avoid creating more pain for yourself. But all the crutches you took, 
all the shortcuts you took, all the lies you told, all the breaches of your ethics, all the compromises of your integrity, all that stuff, in one way or another, you're going to have to contend with. The devotee still contends with it. You know, Krishna frees you from your karma and to hold you in the palm of his hand, but he still gives you enough for you to learn your lesson. We still have to, even if it's just internally, feel the appropriate remorse, realize our mistakes, learn our lessons, and become cured, become better. In that sense, there's no shortcut. It's not blind grace. Just like we shouldn't have blind faith, it's not blind grace. You have to be open and receptive to it. And it's transformative. And part of that is you realize the mistakes you made, you feel appropriately bad, you make amends. You stop trying not to pay for stuff. Does that make sense? So, you can't see where it begins, where it ends, what its foundation is. Ashwatam enam su the Rudha Mulam, very strong roots of this Ashwata tree. Asanga Shastra and Adridhena Chitva. And you, you, after you cut them down with a strong weapon of detachment, so what do you have to do? You have to cut it down with a strong weapon of detachment. You can understand enough of the tree to know you need to cut it down. How do you cut it down? With the weapon of detachment. You realize you can't make out the full form. You can't fully understand it. It's beyond you. But you can at least understand how to cut it down. And what's the power that you have to cut it down? The weapon of detachment. And that, again, is like a spider's web. You learn to avoid it. You don't master it. You learn to avoid it. But with determination, one must cut down this strongly rooted tree with the weapon of detachment. The real form of this tree can't be perceived in this world. No one can understand where it ends, where it begins, where its foundation is. But with determination, one must cut down the strongly rooted tree with the weapon of detachment. And thereafter, one must seek that place from which having gone one never returns and there surrender to that supreme personality of Godhead from whom everything began and from whom everything is extended since time immemorial. Tatapadam tat parimargitavyam. You have to search out that place. Yasmin gata nadivartan tibuya. From which having gone they don't return again. So you have to go to heaven, go to spirit, go beyond this world, right? Go beyond the tree entirely to a whole other plane. Tam eva cha adyam purusham prapadye. And there I surrender to the original person. Prapadye is in the first person. And there I surrender. So this is, the, this is the way you should think. It doesn't say iti, which would have quotation marks, but the way the language is in the first person. And there I surrender to the, to the original being. I can't figure out where the roots begin. Natcha adi. I can't figure out where they begin. But adyam purusham prapadye, I can surrender to the original person. Purusha means person. So Prabhupada's translation here, normally Prabhupada gets a little... He gets a little flamboyant with his translations and jumps into bhakti. Thereafter, one must seek that place from which, having gone, one never returns. That's a clean translation. And there, surrender to that supreme personality of God, from whom everything began. Yata pravritam prashishta purani. And everything's extended since time immemorial. So that 
original idea of the root going upwards is then re-invoked at the end. So what we're left with is the material world as a reflection of the absolute world that gives you enough of a sense of that world that you can use this world therapeutically and you can intuit and search after and look for higher and deeper truths. But the material world is dangerous because the branches go up and down and the roots go up and down and it's in, inexorably karma anubandana. It's inexorably linked to karma. Guna praval, guna... Pravridha. The gunas are nourishing it. Vishaya pravala. <coughs> the sense objects are the sprouts. And so although the tree is linked to something higher, it gets messed up and turns into a spider's web. And even the Vedas, Chandangsi, Barnani, the Vedas are the leaves. And uh, Yatam Veda Saveda Vit. Yastam Veda Saveda Vit. If you know this tree, you know the Vedas. Maybe not every intricate detail of the tree because Narupam Asya Tata Upalabhyate, you can't perceive the form. Nacha Adi. Nanta, nasam pratishtani. You can't find the foundation of it. You can't find the beginning of it. You can't find the end of it. Nasam pratishta. This ashvatam has virudha mulam, very strong roots. But asangena shastrani, with the weapon of detachment. Chitva mulam. You can cut down that root. And after that, Chitva means after having cut down that root. Then, tatapadam, tatparimargatavyam, you can search out that place. What place? Yasmin gata na nivartanti buya, that place from which having gone you don't come back. And then, tam eva chadyam purusham prapadye, then you can search out adi purusha. Adya Purusha, same thing, Adi Purusha, the first being, Adya Purusha, the original being. Prapadya, I surrender to that original being. Yasmin, from whom? Yata, from whom? Pravritti, Prashrishta Purani, from whom everything comes forth and has spread out from time immemorial. And so there is a single source of that tree. You can actually master that tree not by mastering the intricacies of it like a dream who's going to never commit karma and is going to somehow or other save the planet by never doing anything wrong, but by understanding the source of everything. And that's enough. You don't have to get mixed up in the spider's web because you see the spider making the web and you understand what's going on. It's no longer fascinating. You see, okay, it's from, coming from a spider. I can't ever figure out what they're doing, but I'm no longer vexed, I get it. I, went to, I saw them doing like two or three lines, then I went to sleep, I woke up, and it was all done. I can't quite ever figure out how it all got done, the intricacy of it too much for me. Can't quite figure it out. But at least I understand the principle of, that it comes from someplace. I looked at the reflection enough to understand something of what caused that reflection. Did you guys follow that? And that is the first few verses, the first four verses. We get the Ashwata tree, like the banyan tree, this ficus religiosa, the sacred tree from ancient India. You're looking at a, a natural thing and you're learning lessons from it. The roots are going up and down. The branches are all around. You kind of can figure out where the one root is of the tree. But this tree is unique and its roots go upwards. But you can't quite ever figure that out if you get too wrapped up in the tree. So at least you can understand the tree enough to know you need to cut it down to see beyond it. And what's beyond it? A place beyond time. And what's in that place beyond time? The original person that you surrendered to. And what's that person's quality? Everything came from You guys follow that? Does that make sense? I felt like I was fumbling a bit at the beginning, but 
I think it came together at the end. I don't need you like shaking your head like, no, you weren't. I know I was. Maybe you guys aren't smart enough to know I was fumbling. That's okay. But I was fumbling at the beginning, but I felt like it came together at the end. I felt like we honored this section of the Gita. It came together real nicely. Did you guys get it? All right. Thank you very much, IGTV. Anybody on uh, Facebook or live want to say something? <laughs>